So welcome to this evening's conversation and the topic is around how are we going to maximize um, teachers impact on education with limited resources. I want to start off with just welcoming those that are going to be the panelists and we'll introduce them shortly. And um, so we are we are here brought together with the alumni and and office and Cindy is Cindy Jamba is our person there and so thank you to her for organizing this this get together and this panel selecting the panelists and and we are hoping or oh, this collaboration between the faculty of education and alumni to bring these types of conversations to our pre-service teachers but also in service teachers and I think for Cindy the main thing is young alumni so the focus also of this conversation is around young teachers in in the workplace and and how to better prepare and how we can when we go out into the schools we are then um, in south african schools with limited resources and how to navigate that space so we have exciting um panelists tonight with me in the session i'm mainly going to facilitate only their conversation around this topic i will bug in with a few comments i'm sure but we have on the panel tonight mkululi nompumza and they will introduce themselves more fully just in a, in a short moment. We have Dr. Abram de Villiers and we have Leanne Groenewald. And I think, Groenewald, sorry. And I think I, I at this moment actually going to ask um, Mkululi to start off and introduce himself to you, where he comes from, um, why he's an alumnus of, of Stellenbosch University and how he's connected to us and then um, how he connects to this topic. So over to, to the first panelist, please. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Leanne Grunewald. Um, so I started my undergrad at Stellenbosch. Um, I studied intermediate and senior phase, specializing in English and social sciences. Um, wonderful four years being in res, enjoying the whole Marty's life. Um, then graduated and started um, teaching in 2017 um in Grabo in the Platteland um was a shock to my system <laughs> I also decided to study um my honors degree in that first year of teaching as well um in uh, leadership and education and democracy uh after a very hard first year realizing that first year teaching is hard <laughs> And also a personal year where I lost my mother, I decided to extend my honours degree into a two-year degree as I couldn't complete it and realised that my time and my health is very important and also that we're all walking our own paths. Um, we all don't have to finish in a set time that was set up for us by someone else. So yes, um, after that personal struggle, um, got my honours degree the next year, was very happy about that because that was also a struggle. Um, and then um, worked in Grabo for five years. Um, it was a limited resource so school and I had to come up with a lot of strategy, strategies and I will share that um, as we go into the evening. Um, and then um, after five years, um, this year I started at a new school um, in Cape Town. So I left the Platteland for the city, <laughs> another drastic change, different kids, different environment completely, and started as an HOD at the Children Arts Center in Cape Town, where I'm currently at. And I'm loving it being in leadership. I'm loving it I'm managing people. I'm loving the new city life and all the challenges that come with that as well, like traffic and managing all of your time to fit everything in. Um, but that it was, a, it was a great change. Um, and I'm currently residing in the northern suburbs, also living here. So yeah, that's about me and um, what what I studied at Stellenbosch and where I'm currently at. Great. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you for that introduction. And I think, of course, already we see these tips and stuff that you are going to be valuable um, information that you can share with with attendees tonight. So thank you so much for that introduction. So let's go to Mkululi, who is now here, and then after him, Abraham can can go. So Mkululi, over to you. Please introduce to us who you are. Thank you very much, Alzan. My name is Mkululi Nombumza. Um, I am born and bred in East London, in the Eastern Cape. Um, I came up to Stellenbosch to study my B.Ed. in 
intermediate and senior phase, um, completed that in 2017. And in 2018, I um, started my B8 Honours um, in Education, Development and Democracy. Um, I had a short stint of teaching at Pooro, I had a short stint um, you know, of teaching in the faculty. I worked as recruitment and alumni engagement coordinator before taking up a post at West Stafford High School, um, worked a bit with the uh, UCT online high school. Um, and now I am back in the Cape after a short stint in Joburg, um, and I'm at the Center for Creative Education. And what we are is a teacher education institution, private higher education institution in South Africa. And our teacher education is Waldorf inspired. However, our teachers are also you know, capable in the CAPS field. Um, so I am, I guess, quite happy with the position that I find myself in. It is emerge of my you know love for research um, I still teach and I am just in a happy space and that is me that's great happy space is fabulous I think I think also Leanne noted already the wellness thing and, and you're all saying happy space so of course going to engage all of that um, Abraham please please tell us more about you good evening everyone thanks Elzan um, so I had a year at Stellenbosch as an international student, actually, as I was getting my degree in animal science from the University of Kentucky in America. And upon graduating with that degree in animal science, I uh, pursued a, the equivalent of a PGCE um, in California and taught high school science in Los Angeles in Southeast LA in a uh, low income area uh, where there were 99% uh, Latino uh, students and 99% um, of them were on what we described as free and reduced lunch. So a very low income area. And I taught science there for five years um, before getting my master's in educational leadership and becoming a, a deputy principal at another high school um, in LA. Um, in South Central Los Angeles. Um, and at that, that point, I pursued my uh, doctorate in educational leadership from uh, Pepperdine University and became a principal um, at, a, at another school in South Central Los Angeles. Um, and I was there four years and was very proud to say that um, the last year that uh, I was at the school, we had a 100% matriculation rate. Um, and 80% of those matriculants were accepted to a four year university. Um, so my time in Los Angeles was um, always with low, low income uh, communities. And uh, working in schools where uh, we served students that were um, from minority backgrounds. Four years ago, I moved to uh, Stellenbosch and um, started working for an organization called Acorn Education. And we uh, support no fee public schools in Easter River. My role is as head of education and Acorn is part of the school operating, uh, is a school operating partner um, in the collaboration school project. And uh, we have several schools there one of which we're, we're all proud of all of them, but one of which we're super proud of is Apex High School. Last year was their first year of matriculations or matriculants, and uh, they, as a as a uh, quintile one school, um, had an 85% matriculation rate, and 53% uh, of them uh, had a bachelor pass rate. So uh, some really great work being done in East River, just down the road from here. That sounds fantastic, and we know that um, it is a difficult task, especially so our panelists tonight, I hope that everyone realizes that it's such such nice things and it's coming from all over and it's and it's 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 surrounding the same issue that we feel mainly exist maybe in South Africa, but but as you say, Abraham, it it might just be that in any of these types of scenarios or contexts that similar issues um, come up and so maybe you can tell us some more around the similarities of that but also how specifically the South African context operates um, 
Leanne also referred to rural and, and like a rural school as well as a town, some school in the urban space and the difference of that. So we can also talk around those points. Thank you so much. I think I need to introduce myself as well. I um, also did Amazon Ringquest. I also did um, my B8, my honours, my masters and my PhD. I did all of them at Sanabas University. And and I see Shannon Bishop Swad is saying, Abraham, oh, what a what a small world. She knows you and she's my colleague next door. So it's fantastic. It's like a small world and educationists. I, I think we realize we need to support each other. And we need these types of engagements so much. Um, these types of connecting and, and talking around topics like this. Anyway, I interrupt my own introduction. Um, <laughs> I did all my degrees here and I'm currently lecturing in the Department of Education Policy Studies, so, but I'm just here to facilitate the conversation. Um, it is, it's not at all um, about just Salabas University, it's about you in practice and going into schools and, and the reality, I think, around that and how to take care of oneself as you are engaging that space and being a teacher. So I did send our panelists brief questions and like very short things, you know, so because we want to actually just stimulate a conversation and we want to encourage also online participation. So after we've mainly discussed maybe around this question that I will pose that please comment in the chat box so that we can also interact with, with you online. And we'd really like to do that. So as to keep this a very much an open conversation and, and something that is feeling real and not just a lecture towards you, but that, that everybody online also is part of this conversation and adding, adding to it. So please, we invite you to, to partake with us. Uh, my first prompt for us, I think, or for, for, for the three of you would be, and I purposefully did it this way, from your experience with teaching and education in South Africa, what would you think, or in your view, what is the most crucial thing for teachers to know before they enter into a school, before they go in? So currently our students, some of them are online, I see, are prac teaching at schools. And so they're experiencing some things that are, that are, that are, what they normally would say also triggering then but and and so it's a complex space to to navigate so what would you say and let's start with Abram um from your viewpoint on being the the educational convener at Acorn Academy and, and interacting with those types of schools what's the most important thing that that teacher needs to know over to you thanks Elzan um I think it's really important for you to understand that it's going to be very hard work um and it's going to be way harder than you think um it is uh, but it'll also be incredibly rewarding um and uh what's also important to know is that you're you're not alone there there are very able colleagues um in the school building with you um peers that you've met in your program but also um, individuals throughout the um, the sector um, that are there to support you. I would say that I think what you have to get down as soon as you get into your class classroom is that um, inclusive classroom environment. And one way in which to do that is to you have to learn every learner's name within two weeks of meeting them. Like you have to do that. And the reason is um, that they will not think that you care about them um, if you don't know the name. And it's very difficult to teach uh, learners well um, or, or at all uh, if they don't think that you care about them. So learn their names quickly. Another thing that I would uh, certainly suggest is um, preparation is key. Think about the message that sends to your learners when you show up every day with a well thought out uh, lesson plan. Uh, that you are ready to deliver to the best of your ability. Um, they will take that and run with it. Do not waste their time by being unprepared. OK, um, thirdly. And uh, Leanne and Unkululi uh, mentioned it already, but you have to look after yourself. Uh, you need to do the things that you love doing, whether that's reading or hiking, whatever it is, um, things that keep you sane. You have to take control 
of taking care of yourself. I've seen dozens of good teachers leave this profession because they were unable to find a work life balance that suited their needs. Um, and the last thing that I want to really mention here is all three of those um, areas, your principal and the SMT, as uh, Leanne will know, uh, at your school, they are responsible for supporting you in all of that. It is literally part of their job description. They must do what they can to take care of their most, one of the most precious resources, which is the teachers at the school. Um, and if the teachers are not doing well, uh, there is like zero chance that the learners are going to do well. Um, so before you take that first te teaching job, be sure that you are satisfied uh, that the leadership at the school will provide you with the skills to develop both professionally and personally. Thank you. That is that is like in a nutshell, but loads. <laughs> you know, it's it's a lot to to also take in and to unpack. We can unpack this for so long. So. Um, I mean, I'm just wanting to connect straight on from you to um, Leanne. And, and so for you, Leanne, as a practicing teacher at this point in time, also coming from the out of that township environment into the city environment, please share with us what you think is the most important thing for a teacher to take. Oh, what what all of you said, I totally agree. Um, I must say first year teaching for, was very hard for me. I'm, I, I've got into the classroom and thought, yes, I prepared, I have a degree, I'm so excited, I'm going to change minds. And then you have to have this file, um, you have to attend this workshop, you have to be at this sport thing. And then the next morning, you're like, oh my goodness, how do I manage all of this? How can I actually survive in this environment? Um, so I want to um, latch on um, that, yes, boundaries. For me, one of the things that I had to learn is set my boundaries. As a first year teacher, you're young, you're excited, you have a lot of enthusiasm. And if your management um, or if your staff is maybe lacking some energy and your management sees you very happy to go and they don't know how to manage that, they will use you. Um, and all the teachers will see this as a get out point to make you work more than them because they will tell you, we've been through this, we have done this before, now it's your turn. Um, and I do agree we have to learn in this in this system, but you're not to there to be abused or to be overused. Um, you need to put down your boundaries, otherwise you're not going to become that old teacher <laughs> and be able to help someone else. Um, on that point, I also felt that it's really good to know, to get to know your staff when you enter into a new environment, um, especially because you don't know the school, you don't know what is happening. So you need to know the staff, get to know which which teachers are, have strong points in which aspects and which things at school and where you can go and learn from them. Um, I feel that every school should, and I feel SMT should always allocate a mental teacher to a young new teacher to make sure that they actually help and navigate that person. Um, and it's also then the SMT's responsibility to make sure that that mental teacher is actually mentoring the young teacher. Um, if it doesn't happen, it's also the young teacher's responsibility to go to the SMT and tell them, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> um, I need help. Um, so yes, a mental teacher, definitely. Um, I do also feel that um, before you even enter the space of teaching, they are currently doing their practicals at different schools. And I try to do my practicals at different schools that are, that were completely different. Um, I had one in Jamestown. I had one, um, uh, I had one in Kaimandi where I actually took the taxi into Kaimandi and out because I didn't have my own car. So, um, making use of public transport. And then at the end, I ended up my final year at Polaris um, to get the full spectrum of all different cultures, all different communities, all different ways of transport. Um, so as the doctor has said that definitely to inclusive education, you need to know where your learner is coming from and to know your learner, that means you have to actually go in that community and understand what's going on there. Um, so if they're doing their practicals, I do advise them to choose schools from different communities. Um, if you're now gonna stay safe, you're not gonna learn and you're there to learn. Um, if you now, you can be uncomfortable for three months, not, then you can go into that education space with all that knowledge into a nice, comfortable school, but 
coming in with knowledge. Um, we're all not going to get that nice job when we graduate, but we will make that environment the best environment for us. Um, the last things I want to just touch on is the, to have a support system. Um, and that is something that I lacked in my first year as well, because obviously I lost my support system. But to have a good support system, not necessarily in school, but out of school. Um, so you have a good friend circle or your parents or somebody you can just call some days and sometimes you need to cry and just get it out because <laughs> you're going to have that one learner you can't save. You're going to have that one staff member that frustrates you. You're going to have all those moments and you need someone to support you. So please have a support system where you can go to a healthy support system because I have also realized we have unhealthy things like alcohol and food and all of these nice things that we grab onto when we start teaching um, because we don't have a good support system. Um, and that ties in with taking your time, relaxing, all of those things that was mentioned. Um, and then my last warning that I have, um, I had to learn on the hard way to be careful of the staff room. Um, the staff room can be a place of very nice conversations and sharing and a great place, but it can be a very negative space. It can be a place where you have having a great day with your class and you walk in and you have these three teachers who are complaining about how crappy their day is. So you want, you want to be just careful of that space. It is a nice communal space. It's a nice space to be in, but it can also become a space that can affect you very negatively. So in the beginning, be conscious and be safe. Um, enter, enjoy, but also know when to step out and not let that space affect you negatively. Oh, Leanne, yes. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all of that also. I think they just I think we are like this is a good conversation going and I want us to all engage with each other. So let's get him to to share his experience. And I want you actually to talk about you you in early when we met each other, also you spoke around when you went to into school and like how your experience was then going from the university maybe into a school, Kululi. And and just um what do you think is the thing that teachers need to do and use when they note when they are going into school. So over to you. Thank you very much, Alzan. Um, I must say that it's a bit difficult to be put at the end after um, Abraham and Leanne have pretty much scooped everything up, but I won't bore any, <laughs> I won't bore anyone by um, repeating any points, um, but I will mention um, three that I think are quite important. Number one, I am going to echo um, Leanne on pre-service teachers in particular, you know, choosing to diversify their school context. Um, that's a decision that, like um, Leanne, I also made, and it has been truly beneficial in just exposing you to a diversity of context, but also equipping you with the skills that you need when you are exposed to that context. Um, an education degree anyway um, won't prepare you for the context, you know, when you are standing in front of that class. However, you can um, do that yourself throughout your um, professional development as well. Then um, this might sound a bit biased because of my own um, educational background. However, one thing that I, you know, deem quite important um, to know before stepping into the school context are your policies and I don't mean policies by name that a South African Schools Act exists to know the structures and the functions and how they impact your work in terms of learning and teaching to not hear of structures such as the SGB and say it is those people to know that the policies of those people impact your work in the classroom um, so I think for me, it is quite important to know the policy, but also to know um, the functions and structures and how they impact each other and your work as a teacher. Then the last is um, something which I've you know, come to love, and that is benchmarking and learning from best practice. Um, I think we sometimes feel that you know, if um, you as a teacher have identified 
a teacher at another school that is doing something great, reach out, go into that context, learn from that best practice. You're not going to take everything and come and, you know, just impl um, implement it on your side, however you will refine it um, for your context as well. So I think those are the kind of three key things um, to add to what um, Abram and Leanne had already touched on. Right, thank you. It, it is for sure um, best practice and then being brave, like you say, to go and to actually ask that person, can I sit into your lesson or even do you want to come and watch me teach fractions because I think I'm doing something not lucky and the, the students and we often scared to actually ask for support because it is, um, I wrote an article from my PhD and, and published end last year that also says like teachers are just, the findings are also saying that teachers are just isolated within the school and, and basically you are isolated within your classroom and so also linked to what Kululi you now say that and, and Leanne also in a way you can land in a context but you still have your classroom and somehow you can create a space in there that could be what you imagine um, it to rather have to be, but you have limited resources. Now, how am I going to make that shift or how do I get to that place um, is a challenge. And so you'd say, most of you said like, it is hard work. You need to do planning. It's not just laissez-faire. It's not like we're just gonna arrive, um, take the textbook and do something because then that's also when <laughs> Leanne is just going, no, 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 because what happens? And I mean, if we are, let me, maybe let's open up that conversation. So what happens in case um, we are not prepared? So we will have, of course, discipline issues. Um, and Abraham, you said like, don't, don't, it's like an injustice we do to our student or our learner because I'm not prepared to teach you this thing. Maybe I think, oh, but it's that topic, I know it. But students so eager, quickly pick up on the unpreparedness, um, even, you know, and, and others can please join into the conversation when kids will pick up when you're maybe a bit sick and down. They are on top of your emotions before you even know you are emoting and, 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 and trying to, to because they watch you intently all the time. And I think that also to the student teachers, the feedback that I'm getting at this time becomes overwhelming to them the focus on them almost. And, and that's when the wellness starts to not be so well. Um, and they feel like I have such big responsibility, such massive things I need to do. Look at these kids, I have to engage them and they are struggling. Um, and I wanted to just link on to, to most things that you've said, but from my side and what we've started from, from the faculty's end and uh, as a social impact project I started up last year, and early Anne was at one of our events, but to, as a focus, we've called it now teacher calm, but to, to, to signal and create awareness around teacher wellness and that we've not paid attention. And, and Abram, you said like it's, it's earlier, you said um, it's kind of your, the first thing you need to do is take care. You have to take that responsibility and take care of yourself, you said. And so, um, I often feel in schools it's difficult because you are navigating a lot of stuff and how to take care of your wellness and so we need communities and that's why we have started what we have tried to to as teacher common and, and linking also to the end that said you need support outside of the school also right. because right. inside might also be triggering to you you have those people it's difficult to navigate so and the from from maybe maybe you are from first even from a leadership position, and can we can we engage that mentorship thing, mm. um, and support system for a teacher? No, absolutely. I think um, I love love the mentorship idea, and and I've also heard it uh, called like a buddy system. Um, later on, when 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 maybe you need a little bit less mentoring, um, it's it's the the support that you're going to get um, for the most part is inside the, the, the school building. Um, and it might not be all the support that you need, but it will be um, a foundation of support that you can build on. Um, and that uh, that occurs through, you know, relationship building. Um, 
and and I think the leadership has a responsibility there to uh, build the team. Um, and how do you build build the team well? You make a concerted effort to um, create events uh, and space and opportunity for your teachers to get to know each other and for your teachers to interact. Um, and then from a mentorship perspective, like, you know, I think Leanne was alluding to it, not everyone should be a mentor. And just because you're a, uh, a veteran of 5, 10, 15, 20 years doesn't give you a right to be a mentor either. It's a role that really should be earned. Um, and, um, you know, you should be asked to do it by someone on the leadership team or at some stage, you know, you could you could volunteer for it. But it's 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 a role that should be actually pretty well defined because what does it mean to be a mentor? Um, does it just mean I'm going to give give my lesson plans to the to the to the new teacher? Does it mean I'm going to um, go and watch them in the class? Or I'm going to invite them into the class. I'm going to take them out for a, a beer or whatever it might might be. But it needs to be defined because if it's not, then uh, the individual make it will make it whatever they think it should be. Um, and that might become something that's unhealthy. So uh, I really, I, I really um, want to just say again that that the, um, the, I mean the isolation part that you're talking about. You know, people go 20, 25 years in a career, never, never getting into another person's classroom, and that's that's a problem. So there is um, there is a support at the school site, um, but it is the onus is on the individual to go and find it if it's not already being created by leadership. And I think often, I mean, let's let's maybe have Kululi, in your stance being at the schools, right? Did you experience management actually concertedly coming to you asking um, how can we support you or were you set up in that way? I can ask the same question to you and to Leanne can follow you just after maybe. What was your experience with mentoring as you entered into school? I was quite fortunate, um, specifically in my um, last teaching role, um, that at the school that I was at, mentorship is taken quite seriously. So it is, um, for instance, the person that Abram um, describes, it is your senior teacher, it is somebody on the SMT, and the school that I was at had an entire mentorship program. So from the policies all the way to mentoring you on the kind of minor things that happen in um, the classroom. That was, you know, definitely in place for me. However, um, I think we all know that that's not the context um, that everybody finds themselves in. In some cases, that uh, kind of responsibility is just given as tick boxes, check whether you've done this and that, um, but there isn't much um, that goes into professional development. And I think Instead of, you know, kind of giving an answer to this, I think I'm just going to raise a question that's um, come up for me often when, you know, I am in a school context and I'm thinking about the elements of mentoring and, and management. And I ask myself the question whether, you know, our governance and our leadership structures in the school give enough recognition to that management structure, give enough kind of, you know, um, power to it to actually move you know um, i'm not saying that uh management um you know people aren't active in schools i'm just saying let's look at perhaps how much our governance and our leadership structures are restricting their um, own initiatives thank you for that and I see you nodding. I see you are, you are <laughs> wanting to say that thing, so please go. Oh, I had not the same experience at all. Um, <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, so being in the school that I was in Cabo, um, we were only in the high school context, we were only one teacher per subject. So um, your mental subject, your mental teacher couldn't actually mentor you in your subject. So um, I teach visual arts and um, Obviously, my ways of doing things are a bit different most of the time than to other teachers because I like to come in like by the back door to surprise my kids in my class. Um, and we have a more practical subject. So um, what I'm doing in my class will not necessarily match what's happening in the math or maybe in the English class or whatever. Um, so I couldn't really be mentored on a on a subject base. But 
in the end, that was not what I was lacking. I was lacking somebody telling me what is a QMS file? How do I, you know, manage my day to day? Um, how does it look to do um, duty on the playground? Like, what must I look at? Like, what is dangerous? What's not dangerous? I mean, I don't have my own children. I'm young. So, I mean, you're climbing in a tree, you know, <laughs> maybe like the platelung kids climbing trees. I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, so just like a basic example like that. Um, I lacked mentorship. We had a mentorship at school, um, a program, but it it still, after I left, it was still failing um, as all the teachers were, were mainly used um, because younger teachers were still too inexperienced um, and that there wasn't, that was, that Abram said was, was like really good. It wasn't a set program. It wasn't like you have to show this to the teacher and this to the teacher and this to the teacher. It was like, oh, mentor them. We had one meeting in the beginning of the year of like a hi, welcome everybody. Here's your mental teacher. And then there was no follow up. Um, so mentoring for me didn't have really good success. And when I tried to mentor um, the younger, newer teachers and step up, when I veiled myself, um, I was said to like, yes, but your subject doesn't match like these subjects um, that they're teaching. So um, sorry, but you can help out on the meeting or you can do this. And then in, in as like, this is not what I want to do. I actually just want to support young teachers because they are lacking in so much skills when they get here. And with the kids we were teaching, they weren't prepared. Our kids were they're very active kids. They they love to talk. They're very in your business because it's a platter land. They want to know everything about you. And you don't know how necessary if you I came from the northern suburbs like I don't even know my teacher's first name when I was at school these kids now want to know everything about you um but I didn't know how to manage that um and I needed guidance so I did not have the same <laughs> experience um but I do believe that management um must step up in that sense and create a, a program um, I do just want to mention um, or just add on to some things that you said um, with the isolation. Um, I think that's what happened to me. I felt very isolated because of my subject. Um, and we could still learn from other teachers, although we don't teach the same subject. Because teaching is a skill. It's it's not, you can, I must be able to even pick up the math book and teach math if I'm put in that situation. Um, because it's, it's a type of skill that we need to communicate with our kids and how we're working with them. Um, as an SMT member now, we are managing our QMS system and I get to now visit different classes with different teachers. I'm constantly still learning. Um, and I actually wish we could do this and visit each other's spaces and see just what we're doing. Maybe even SMT could just, let's not, not just, Okay, depending on how big the school is, but I mean, let's just not meet necessarily in the staff room and meet in someone else's class. See what they teaching materials on their walls. See how they structure or place the kids in the classroom. I mean, there's the small things we can pick up from each other that's not necessarily about my subject, but how I manage my classroom. And I think that's really important. Um, and then one other thing that you touched on that you said about, um, but actually um, being prepared. Um, for me, being prepared is very important, as you said, for discipline, but also noticing the kids, um, actually taking in and being very observant. Um, I mentioned knowing their names, but also more than that, building those relationships. Um, and I think one thing we touch, all touched on is building relationships. Um, we need to build good relationships in our staff that is a colleague relationship doesn't mean that's your best friend you have to whatsapp them when you get home or whatever it must be a relationship where i could ask you questions and you can answer me on a professional base and help me when i need that help um and we do realize and i know people know that in staffs <laughs> staff um environments it's not always that professional and it's not always that clean cut because people do get offended and do do have emotions um, but I do feel that we need to try to establish that professionalism back in schools because it's become very informal. And I think people have gotten hurt in these spaces where we need to have that professional thing. I can come to you for advice um, and you give me advice, even though we didn't like just have a meeting and I didn't agree with you. I mean, we we disagree. We go on. I ask you advice, you help me, we go on because we're here for the kids. And that professionalism still needs to be planted there. I think you said that very last thing just 
hits me and resonates that you say we are here for the kids and I think earlier when we met each other we kind of you go to that point so why are we here and we are here for those kids and so I think often and, and also the topics that I lecture in we lose sight of the child and so we are getting all all busy with being a teacher you know like doing the job but the job is to care for and to build up that child. And I think when we lose that sight there, then, and, and we don't have collegial relation, we have wishy-washy, re because when we realize we are here for that child, I, I guess, I hope that our response is, oh, we need to support each other through this thing. This is an immense job. This is like very important. Let's be there for each other, you see. And uh, when you need to go to the toilet, just knock on my door and I will just stand outside and help you out there for a second. Because even that, and I often with the students in my in my lecture rooms, we talk around this and, and I often I often bring up the same type of stuff. Like I want to open it to the online now, but um like not being able to even just go to the bathroom um, when you need to because you have a class then you have a responsibility to care for them so you can't just walk out okay so we know that piece and and as Mukulili says you know the systems know what to do what not to do know um that and we teach that type of theory and, and law and stuff but when it gets down to the real thing we're a human we need to like do stuff and we get overwhelmed are we there to support each other or or is the one teacher, like you say, the staff room is very scary. And, and so from, from me, before we take some um, comments from, from the um, online uh, members, I just want to say that I always have in my mind this wellness thing where we misuse those moments where we can actually recover from what we've experienced in class. We have break, but we then sit in the staff room and, and continue the negative talk or, or skinning somewhere. And so... We are not allowing ourselves even that wellness break. We do have break to, to be able to catch up, but we can't because we maybe go and, and have that conversation in the staff room rather than taking that moment for self to, to recover and, and almost not taking that seriously, the wellness piece, the taking care of myself and what does that entail in a day at school. Um, but but on this point, could we could we ask someone online, Shannon, or anybody to just chip in and, and make a comment on, on join the conversation on what you've um, heard now? Are they able to actually just speak or are they all muted? Oh, they are all muted. So now they must type things to us. So please type um, type questions. Um, we now see that we cannot just let you in to talk to us. So please type in the, in the chat if there are things that resonate. Um, the second question that I had to the panel, so as we wait for some comments from online, was posing this conundrum. And I think what we are talking around tonight is a conundrum. Like we cannot solve the fact that we have limited resources and how we're going to be superpower humans and, and teaching, but we are going to con converse around it. And we really definitely need to unpack the, the things. And I hear Leanne say that she's come with some some practical stuff that she wants to share also. So let's get into this question, which which was a conundrum. How can an educator, and I put this in, 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 in uh, quotation marks, almost taking it from our, our topic, do the most with limited support in and outside of their classroom and a, and a follow-up of that also is, is what is needed to maximize what is now needed to maximize your teacher impact and just as a stance point from my side and and the project called teacher calm that i've had this line that just resonates with me and just stays with me and i want to make a sticker of it i think teachers have to like stick it everywhere is it says um, my holistic wellness is the key to extraordinary education because if that teacher is depleted and only surviving how is that person going to show up in a magnificent way in an inspiring way in a way to be creative um, so from my side it's, it's mainly that and of course you can link on to that and we are saying that wellness is a very important key piece but from your side what is needed to maximize? Let's start with Leanne as she's she's indicated she has brought us some stuff that she has done in in a in a Shabo school there. Um, how did she? How did you survive, Leanne? Um, with limited resources, almost no mentoring, but you did things. You stayed for like how long? Four or five years. And five. so, <laughs> well done. And and share with us all that you've learned 
I mean, not all. Um, <laughs> There's <loads of> <laughs> yeah, not all. <laughs> Let's have um, I think I think the five years was definitely due to the kids. Um, I think after three, I should have left, but um, I couldn't. My heart was just sure. Um, I still have some matriculators WhatsApping me now, and then whew, the heart, it just, <laughs> I can't deal. Um, I think some points that I wrote down here, one of the big points was relationship building. Um, I couldn't necessarily build those relationships in my school always, um, due to it being a very small town, people talking, there was sometimes not a great um, set of unity underneath the staff. So I did struggle. Um, I made one or two friends and then they left. We had a staff that was constantly changing. Um, so you didn't even know like who to latch on to because next year they may, may not even be there. Um, so in the end, I did try to build relationships outside my school with other teachers from other schools, um, with my subject advisor, um, with just general connections in education. Um, I really tried to attend as much workshops as I could to get to know my circuit, my district, where I'm at, because on the other side of a mountain, things are completely different and how that functions. And through those connections, I actually ended up supporting, there would be like a teacher, um, uh, um, Tina that's still teaching there at the education department. Um, she, um, I kept in contact with her and then at the end she said, oh, but I was teaching at home and then I'm stopped teaching now. So I have all these things. Don't you want to come collect them? And then I was like, oh, I will be there with my car. Like, just put it in the boot. Let's go. Um, um, I collected toilet rolls and I would phone when we went to a bra, I would tell the, tea, the my friends, you know, guys, your mayonnaise bottles, just keep them for me, please. Um, I'll come pick them up. Um, and in the end, I had enough um, holders for all my stuff to store them. In the end, I... Um, had a really good functioning classroom. Um, at every every meeting we were, I didn't take no for an answer. I was like, when, is that, when am I getting a budget for education? Um, in my classroom, visual arts needs a budget. I can't function like this. Then like, yes, it's on the, it's on the topic. Yes, we're going to discuss at the HGB meeting. I'm like, I need feedback, please. Um, so I know that I knew when they had the meeting the next day and I would go into the office and say, um, can I have feedback, please, on the meeting last night? Because um, like... Um, MK said, you must know what you can and can't do. So I knew what I could do and I could ask and I was in, I had the right to have feedback. I had the right to do, you know, but I had the right to have this and this. So I made sure that I knew my things and I, I, fought, I fought for them. Um, you do get tired. I'm not going to lie. After like some weekends, I was just like, I'm over this, you know, I'm just going to, I can't do this anymore. And that's a support system I was talking about. Um, the one thing I want to definitely tell teachers is um, to check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> um, uh, reflection. It comes down to reflection in the end. Um, I had to sit down because I couldn't, I limited resource in my school. I couldn't go to another teacher to help me with my, with my actual subject. Limited resources. Um, I started design at... Um, my Hrabo school and I taught grade 10, 11 and 12 um, and my subject advisor never came to visit me in those four years of me actually getting subject off ground starting in at the school. She did communicate with me with email but I really needed that in-person contact um, but I didn't have that so in the end I had me and I needed to sit down with myself and say okay I've done this lesson do I feel it was successful um, after marking my tests, I went and I analyzed and checked, okay, how many kids got question one right? How many kids got question two right? And I had to set up goals for myself as a teacher. Um, you know, where, where do I see the problems in my question papers, in my teaching, in all of that? And sometimes you have to be really honest with yourself. It's not pretty. Um, sometimes I walked out of my class and they'll be like, Anne, you weren't good today. Like, mm-mm. You know, mm -mm, you need to come back tomorrow to this stage and you need to present and be on top of things. Um, um, and it's not easy, especially without that support system. So reflecting, building relationship, making those connections and making sure that you check yourself. Um, because I can tell you guys, those two months I was at home due to COVID was the best two months I had in five years. Um, and that's when I realized I have a problem. I need to work on myself. Um, 
because if I'm good, if my cup is overflowing, then I can give to the kids. If my cup is empty, I can't. And that and that becomes a problem. And as you've said, the kids know when it's not a good day. They would walk into my class and say, Miss, why do you look like that? And I'm like, look like what? Then like, you're upset about something. And I'm just like, uh, no, <laughs> I am not. We are teaching now. What are you talking about? Then I said, no, I'm missing my shade. I'm saying, now you want to talk because I want to learn. But in the end, that is a good relationship with your kids. Um, but they do know when it's not good. So you need to be good so they can have a good lesson. And I think what you call on also now is that authenticity that we, yes, sometimes, of course, we are not well. And so we also need to, uh, that's difficult to be, to show up authentically, but to then have a way to say, yes, it's a rough day, and and but to manage that. You can't just be dysfunctional that day. You are still showing up. You still, still have the same responsibilities, and you still have these kids that are just sitting there waiting for you to impress them um, and to guide and them. If I can just add on to that, um, that authenticity is so important because I've realized, especially with my younger kids, I teach currently grade two, grade four, grade five, and seven, 10, and 11. Um, and having that spectrum, um, my grade 11s and 10s obviously can can analyze my emotions and understand where it's coming from, or no, they have that emotional intelligence. But with the younger kids, um, they don't really understand sometimes, but it's so important for them to start understanding the emotions because nobody speaks to them about emotions. Um, I had to go to four boys fighting the other day. And when I actually unpacked the whole fight, it was about jealousy and owning up to being my friend. And I had to tell them it's okay to be jealous because we all get jealous. It's emotion we need to recognize. So it's okay if you're having a bad day. It's okay if you're angry because we all do ho have those bad days. But now that I've acknowledged the emotion, it in, in the end, it's my choice. How do I react? So I do, I'm, you know, you've just put in better words than I can. I try to acknowledge that with my kids and tell them, like, Miss is not having a great day, but we still have to work. I still have to get up and come to work because that's creating that environment, teaching them responsibility, teaching them that, yes, I have the emotion, I recognize, I'm working on that, but that shouldn't affect necessarily everything. If it is affecting it, I must acknowledge it and tell them how am I working through it. Um, and and that and that's good and showing that vulnerability um sometimes we would talk about parents in the class and i would get emotional um and i would sometimes even cry and the kids were like sometimes they don't know how to react kids get very quiet when you cry <laughs> um and in the end they actually they actually said that some of the kids would come off the class and tell me that thank you miss that you shared that because i'm also going through a tough time i also don't know how to deal with this um, I lost my grandmother or something like that. And then actually by sharing those emotions and telling them, okay, I'm coming out stronger on the other side, they grow as well. So as you are saying that, Shannon is resonating with you. Shannon Bishop Swart, um, so a lecturer at Stanford University, and she's she's noting, uh, maybe I should just read it out. Um, she says to you, Leanne, I'm so glad you mentioned reflection. Um, I was in an interview once where I was asked, when did you know you, um, you needed to move on to the next teaching challenge? It forced me to really reflect on my teaching experience, my relationships with students and staff and the environment, toxic or not, and my limitations. One needs to face oneself. Um, and it was a powerful light bulb moment for, for Shannon. Thanks for sharing, Shannon. Um, Kululi, can you share with us your thoughts on this conundrum, how to maximize coming coming maybe from from your from your perspective? Hey, there's Kakamba from um, she she also is posing a question that we'll get to just after. Thanks for that question. Good. Thank you very much, Alzan, and thank you to Leanne as well. Um, I think to just add on to Leanne's points. Um, firstly, I'd like to go back to a point that you had mentioned earlier about um, how we often lose sight of the child, um, you know, as being the center of the work that we do. And um, it is upon entry into the space that I'm in now, working with the, the Waldorf philosophy, which obviously places um, the child at the center and having our institution, you know, um, one of our graduate attributes is 
um, you know, kind of child-centered approach. And it's because of the environment that I'm in now that I can say we often lose sight of the child as one of our biggest resources in the midst of not having any resources. Um, I think we often look if we are, for instance, um, I'll just give an example of preparing for a life skills or li uh, life orientation lesson. There's a focus on different cultures and you as a teacher who isn't of, for instance, closer background, strain yourself in kind of finding resources for this lesson when your learners are that resource. Um, so I'm not saying that um, teachers don't have the constraint of resources and they don't have the um, constraint of support. However, I think in the midst of that, um, I always like to look at a way out. And I think one of the ways out is to look at our learners as you know, one of our um, biggest resources. Then secondly, um, and it will touch in, I think it will also um, tie up with something that Leanne had mentioned earlier. And I think you had also mentioned it actually, Alzan, and that is around the concept of lifelong learning as teachers. Um, and I think it exists as one of the seven roles of becoming a teacher in South Africa. Yet I think it's something that we just leave in policy and we never actually enact it. You know, perhaps Alzanda throws another um, you know, spanner in the works of the faculty and teacher educators to look at how, for instance, um, that whole lifelong learning aspect becomes something that we enact. Um, if the program of teacher education doesn't enact it, then how do we expect teachers, for instance, in the context or in the field to enact that lifelong le um, learning. And I think if you as a teacher are continuously engaged in a process of finding out, making sure that you are beyond prepared. And what I mean by beyond prepared is you are reading in and above your context. You're constantly empowering yourself because I think within that empowerment also comes then my third point, um, which I call, I've come to call it, now that I myself, I think, have um, finally found it. And I think it's to find your calling within the calling. You, you in, you've heeded the calling that is education. However, for instance, for me, when I got into the classroom and into the school context, I decided that this wasn't for me. And that is because I could not deal with the day-to-day -day routine that is school without the, the change. I am that type of, you know, project person, something new needs to come, something vibrant. And, you know, I, I got to that part where I had to ask myself that question, can I perhaps create these opportunities for myself within the school context? And when I came to the answer of no, I had to also make that bold decision to say it is a no. And before your feelings kind of impact your class and they spill into your class and the you know, kind of learning and teaching, I then had to take that decision to say, I'm stepping out of this part of, of education. Um, and I think that's the whole thing to say in that process of reflection, find your calling. And you know, once you've found that calling within the calling, I think it's to set your own path, set your own path of getting there. We all know, for instance, that you know, career pathways within education, specifically in schooling, are quite blocked off. Um, you know, it will take you a couple of years to become part of the SMT, to become deputy, or even if you're lucky to become principal. Um, so I think it's also quite good for teachers or anybody actually in education to set their own um, career path in that regard. So I think those would be my points. Lovely points that you're making. I see Shannon also saying I, I, I love this, finding your calling within the calling. I feel that we all here resonate and, I'm, and mostly others will because we've all journeyed in that way, right? Um, getting some applause there from Amra. Because, I mean, myself included, I taught for 12 years. I taught in Grabo at a township school, under andere, you know, but I also taught for a long time in special needs education at various levels of teaching in that space. And then out of there into the university space and now facing like not, it's not a special needs child and I'm not teaching maths, I'm now, lecturing sociology of education, education management management and policy to students at university level, pre-service teachers. And as we are shifting in and amongst, but as you said, clearly the, the, we don't have a lot of things. So each 
has their own journey within education. But what you know is that you are calling into this education field and you can't you cannot leave <laughs> because you love kids. And I hope, as someone said in the one session we had with teacher calmly, and I think you were there, the psychologist opens up the session and she says, everybody doesn't like children. And that actually shocked me. At that point, I was like, what? Like, yeah, everybody do doesn't like children. And so we just stuck at being teachers. We think everybody should like children, but even teachers sometimes don't like children. So that's problematic. And we can see that in classrooms, uh, in schools, when we go work there. Before I talk too much, I want to actually ask this question to, to you and to the panel um, that um, Kakamba from 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 Salabash, she posts here, yeah, how accessible is employee wellness services for teachers at government schools, at public schools? I think that's the, the ask. So, Leanne, you're raising your hand there. Please respond and then Abraham after. Um, so currently the WCD has um, a wellness um, branch. You can phone if you can put it that way. So there's wellness cards accessible to all teachers um, that you can phone. Um, I've never made use of it, but we actually as a school have made use of it. Um, we've currently in our school had a, a problem with two teachers who did not get along. Um, and we are only a staff of seven um, and they both work in foundation phase next to each other. So you guys can imagine um, if those who don't get along, we have issues. Um, and we phoned and we got a mediator to actually come in and they actually have separate sessions now and the mediator separate sessions with them together. Um, and it's been helping the teachers look relieved. Um, they personally also know their personal stories and both of them have gone through trauma and things happen in their lives. And obviously that has come now into the area of the school and obviously into their relationship. And that has also made it where it ended up to be in not a great space. Um, and in their sessions, they have a psychologist to, to use and they have the mediator now. And I must say, I can see a complete difference in both of the teachers um, and in their working relationship. Um, and it took us, us about a week to organize everything and get everything on board. So it was actually really in a good space and time. Um, so yeah, I haven't phoned the, the line myself. Um, but I feel it is accessible. I feel it is good. Um, but that is now outside of your school. That is the WCD provides that service. Um, but it's not, I don't know, every school is different and how they support you. And that's also a thing, how accessible your school makes it. That's also a question you must ask. <laughs> or, or maybe the question, how important do they think wellness is? I think that's... Mm -hmm. Currently, Abram, you can totally now connect yeah, okay. to that for us as from a leadership positioning and schooling. I think not not just education, like all over, but I, I hope that COVID has signaled loudly to us. And like you said, Leanne, that space where we were at home, we realized, whoa, how, what am I all doing in, to, in this time? I'm squashing in too much work. I'm never resting. I'm just doing these things. Look at how much better I feel when I can rest. This is who I really am. We are like lost ourselves. So Abram, please, please come connect yeah. to that for us in, in a sense where, sure. Um, yeah. Sure, I'm, 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 I'm really happy to hear that um, Leanne and, and her colleagues have had a, a good experience with um, you know, the services provided by the WCD as it pertains to employee wellness. Um, but you're right, it's not, the, it's not the experience of many, many teachers that, that actually need it. And many schools that that need it, and I think part of it is just lack of communication. Like, if people knew that that hotline existed, and it was uh, promoted by not just the WCD, but but the the in, in leadership at the schools, uh, would more teachers use it? And um, you know, my assumption uh, would be, yeah, they they would use it more more often. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think it's it's. It's not really a, a, um, a buzzword anymore, this this work life balance and, and, and wellness, not just in the education world. It's, it's, it's very, very real. And um, leaders that don't take it seriously uh, are in peril, um, you know, because if they don't have uh, their ego is too big to um, accept that uh, individuals need different types of support. 
um, you know, in, again, individuals that they're responsible for uh, developing both personally and professionally, then they shouldn't be leaders. Um, and and unfortunately, um, and uh, Uncle Luli, uh, you know, uh, referenced it, but what happens particularly here in, in, in South Africa that I've seen is that people become principals, not because of their leadership skills, generally because of their teaching skills. And if people are not being uh, prepared real well to be teachers, you can only imagine how well they're being prepared to be principals. Um, and uh, so, um, so not only is is it important for um, the teachers in front of the in front of the kids to have the, the the wellness, it's also important for the leaders to have it. But you know, if you're if you're not acknowledging that it is, it's even necessary, then it, it then it just isn't going to happen. And I think Liana had such a great story about the lengths that she went to in Khrabo to try and make it work. Like, um, you know, it was, and, and your North Star or your guiding principle is always the kids, is you, everything that you were doing, you kept the main thing, the main thing, and the kids were the main thing. And you did everything in your, in your, um, in that you could to make it work. And unfortunately it didn't. And then you had to make a really hard decision um, to to you know to move and go somewhere else and i think that that's 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 something that I, I hope people can hear because um you know sometimes it just doesn't work out and you have to make a you have to make a a choice and a decision that's going to be best for yourself um and uh and that's okay and that's actually really really good and and wise and smart to do even though you're going to miss the the children even though you're going to miss you know parts of the the community um at the end of the day you know if you're not if you're not able to feel supported and um coming into coming into school like happy and excited then then you're not going to bring the best self um with the kids yeah definitely that bringing a positive version of you showing up in in that way like in a in a well well you need to be well to do that otherwise you're going to come here miserable because you are and i mean sometimes and as we are maybe stuck in a space so i felt this uh that you are once you feel stuck in that space you're stuck at that school and it's easy then to just see all the negative things around you um because there are many, it's a school, it's a public schools, I mean, or whatever it is, there are many, it doesn't, we know this, it's it's pretty obvious, it's not working that well. And so for us to almost acknowledge, thanks Leanne for posting all the details there, cool, in the chat, uh, the contact details. Um, but I think that the most important thing is that we need to, be, the all the levels, like leaders need to acknowledge taking care. Is that, is that caring for each other thing? Because inherently as teachers we go oh i'm caring for the kids but also we need to start caring for each other and leaders need to start caring for for the and i think that is a it's it's highlighted in in, in academic research on education also now that care concept um and i hope COVID has also in, brought that into the light more that we say we we cannot be like this with each other any longer and especially not at schools where we actually need to support and carry each other but um and and to do this job, which is what which we say is a tough, tough thing. I just looking at my notes and we said boundaries are important. It's tough. We need mentors. Um, we need to be inclusive. It's hard work. Preparation is key. You take care of yourself. Um, and what else did I so much it's lifelong learning, problem solving approach rather than oh, so actually just we cannot come in negatively. That's a lot to deal with, but we need to come with this problem solving attitude we're not going to go oh it's a problem and it's and it's oh my poor life but to go like 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 all of you have shown you have to shift you have to be flexible you have to be strategic you have to yourself as a teacher become um almost that uh, resourceful um, and what does that entail to be resourceful is knowing oneself initially and then knowing boundaries and all those other things we are probably almost wrapping up. Cindy, what do you think? Cindy is sitting across from me here and she's going, yeah, probably. Uh, but I want to still see if someone someone else has a comment. Let me just quickly um, look through. Uh, we did, Miss McGoldrick says, I was in a high school that was extremely academic. 
the main focus was on the matric exam. So we see that meritocracy idea, all just going to getting the marks, you know, and that that type of focus instead. And it is great to hear from teachers that the focus on students are not only the marks. So, so I feel from my side, I'm just going to respond quickly, but I want you also, Leanne wants to respond. That's like a contextual, you know, um, so that school might create that culture in that school with that focus, superly on sport or superly on academics and et cetera, and then totally lose touch with all the others. It's just this one, one focus. There's no holism. There's no not seeing the human in holistic terms any longer. And to me, that unsettles my, my innermost core question on what is education? What, what is schooling doing? Is it just throwing all this knowledge in your brain that you in any way forget? What do we in any way remember? from schooling uh, and often it's like a one-liner from a friend or a teacher that has put your life in a different route but sorry Leanne please respond to to that comment for us um it's not exactly under that comment but also that I've, I've realized that schools have become very paper pushing um a lot um as long as we tick the boxes as long as we make sure that this looks good on paper and then we are fine um and and that's not necessarily what's happening um i had a, a problem with my previous school that we did a lot of paperwork and um there's nothing wrong with paperwork you need to have it you need to make sure it is in place it's part of policy to make sure everything is there um i mean we have to get stuff done and let's be proof of it that is it's fine but when it becomes so that we we having uh, a checking with staff um and you sign in for the meeting and there's like a check-in and then you sign out but when you walk out there you didn't really get something from it um exactly like that are we checking kids in you know teaching getting the stuff done and then checking them out um but there was no actual check-in with them as a person um and most of those schools um i'm very like putting them on a one umbrella now but those schools are mostly focused on just academics or 100% um, metric pass rate um, I have found that I've heard a lot of most of these kids then being on medication and being depressed or um, don't know how to manage life outside of school when they come to university um, because they actually haven't been taught to the skills that they need to cope they've just been taught to do stuff and get it done um, and I'm scared that, that schools get managed in that way because in the end, um, your staff is not coping, your kids are actually not coping, but from the outside, it looks very fluffy duffy. Um, but on the inside, there's not really happy stuff happening. I hear you so much. Uh, also very much resonating with me. I wonder if Abram Mkululi quickly wants to respond. I see one more comment here and then we can wrap it up, I guess. Yeah, no, I'm so glad that um, uh, McGoldrick uh, brought that up because, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about our wellness, but uh, not a whole lot of time talking about the the learner wellness. And, you know, they, they've they've gone through some seriously challenging times as well in the last couple of years and obviously before that. And and I think when you when you don't um, make time to 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 look after the, the well-being of, of, of kids, um, then then there's something seriously wrong. At the at the school level, and and if it's win at all costs, uh, um, I mean we we've seen locally in high schools in this town uh, the the terrible tragic events that can occur when uh, when when children are not uh, cared for uh, adequately by the school and surroundings. So, thank you. And clearly, a closing comment maybe on that from your side. Um, I don't think I've got a closing comment on this in particular. I think I'll just add to um, the wrap up. Uh, yeah, I think that's my. So I just want to read um, this last comment we got in the chat. It says, um, Infant Cell says here, I think we need to make sure that we keep on being people. Learners must know that we are people, meaning teachers are humans too. Um, if we are wrong, we should apologize. And I think I wanted to earlier also say that admitting authenticity and being vulnerable and saying, hey, ooh, I, that was wrong. Sorry, rectify, because we are humans in the real world. And that's just teaching them real world stuff. And so your comment comes on, if we are wrong, we should apologize. If something funny, we should laugh. Yeah, we shouldn't be these formal, we should be 
be that all of the things, you know, and not just one identity that we imagine we should be as a teacher. So sharing our humanity, you say it so beautifully. We build relationships with the kids and only through the relationships do the kids really learn. True. I saw a video also, the woman says, children don't learn from people they don't like. So you must make sure your kids like you. Yeah. And so that that might be the key thing here. So thank you for that comment. I think it also just captures captures the heart of it. Um, and I think on this note, Cindy, would you like to say something? Cindy doesn't want to say something, um, but I would like to, to um, really, Anne agrees there. So I'd just like to thank you three as the panel um, and want to just invite you maybe to make a last comment, um, a closing comment or what you, your takeaway is from this session. Um, you know, I'm, I'm feeling like supported actually <laughs> in my thoughts and, and in, in, in the way that I feel around education. So thank you for, for this conversation. I think we've shared, I think the, the people online also resonates with, with this conversation. So closing lines, let's go Mkululi, Abram and then Leanne maybe. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alzan. Um, and thank you once again to everybody for the invitation to share this platform. Um, I think one thing that it restores in me is um, everybody that has, you know, heeded the calling of, of teaching has already won because we go through so many naysayers. Um, there are, you'll seldom find people who will tell you to go into the teaching profession. So I think when we recognize that we've won the first battle and that the second is our education and schooling system, which is a mammoth task, but um, what this conversation has really restored in me is that um, it is a mammoth task, yes, but everybody has a, a role to play. And I think if you are looking at the commitment of people that are present in this conversation as well, it just shows you that we we are our solution. And I think the, the quicker we look intrinsically, um, I think the, the better. Um, so yeah, I am quite encouraged by this conversation and I thank you once again for um, the opportunity. Fabulous. I'm also encouraged. I'm also feeling fab. Abraham, from you. From you. <laughs> yeah, no, that, was, that was really, really well said, Mkululi. Um I just want to latch on again to uh, what uh, Fonseil said. I think the um, uh, one of the most powerful things I ever did in my classroom was just apologize for 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 um, for a wrong. And um, and that just made me uh, so much more human uh, to to those to those learners. Um, look, there's there's a lot of hope and there's a lot of reason to be hopeful, um, but there is uh, uh, there's a lot of hard work um, ahead of us. And and I think that this sector is um, small enough to where uh, we can and should um, engage in a more meaningful manner uh, in order to um, you know help each other out in the areas that that we need help so uh, this is a great platform in which to do so and and new teachers going into the role next year just know that there are a lot of people that have been in your footsteps and that are willing to to help out um, even if it's just over a cup of coffee thank you the end um, so yeah, I've summarized a few points. Um, I think first of all, that when you start out as a young teacher, it's going to be hard. Um, finding your feet, finding yourself, setting those boundaries, balancing life, work, all of that, because it's not to the, the social Stellenbosch anymore. It's now the real world out there. So I think in the beginning, though, all those factors are really hard to manage, but it does get better after six years, I can tell you. Um, don't say I have the re the recipe down, but I do come home and pick my dog and feel like a better person. Um, I think also a good job change helped, but I, I, I do believe that that you can get there. So if it's hard now, if somebody, if anybody's struggling now, just remember you can get there. Um, reflection is growth for me. 
Um, I sit at the end of each term and I make time, even if I have to take a day or an hour out of my holiday and I reflect on what did, um, what happened, what upset me, what made me happy, um, what did, how did my kids feel, how did my kids react, what happened with my marks, all of that. I just sit down and just have a good, you know, cup of tea with myself and my, and my practice and um, even now in my leadership role, do I feel I'm connecting with my staff, do I feel I'm supporting them? Um, to reflect, am I feeling that I'm on course with where I want to go? Um, look after yourself. That is a very important point that we've all touched on here. Um, look after yourself. Have a private life. Set those boundaries. Um, you know, have that break time where you just close your door and you're just like, oh, just breathe. Um, have that cup of tea. Eat that chocolate. Enjoy. Um, just, just check in with yourself. Um, build relationships. Um, I thought I could do it alone um, in the beginning, um, and I quickly realized I'm I can't be an island. I need I need I need life. I need things. Um, so yes, so I really I needed to check in with myself and build those relationships and have that support network. Um, and lastly, and the most important is do not forget why we're there. Our goal is the children. So I need sometimes when I don't want to get up in the morning, I'm like, there is faces waiting for me. And they are excited to come to my art class and to paint and to do things. Um, so I need to get up and go. That is why I'm there. So even though maybe I'm not feeling great, I, I have a responsibility and I have I have a goal. And my goal in the end is to make those kids happy, to teach them art, to let them express themselves. And that's why I get up in the morning and that's what I do what I do. Um, and that's why we do it in leadership to create a good staff environment or a school that functions for those kids. If in curriculum development or teaching students, we get up and go because we're creating the future. So we mustn't forget why we're getting up in the morning. I think that's the most important one. Sure. Let's just end with that. Let's tomorrow morning remember why we are here. And I think everybody can now do a little reflection you know, before they <laughs> before they they leave. But thank you so much to everybody on the panel and all that's that's in in the in the session with us and to Cindy and the uh, Marty's alumni office for for organizing this conversation. Hopefully we will have more of these. I just imagine we should now stay connected and, and continue doing this type of conversing. Great. Thank you so much. We will talk again. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye.